Welcome, everybody. Uh, very excited to be here for this next session. And it was very exciting to see our previous session around heart regeneration and biophilia, uh, led by our friend Tim West. Uh, so this session will um, be around the topic of uh, food waste and loss and how to reduce that. Um, as you, you all know, the, the global food system is responsible for up to one third of all human caused greenhouse gas emissions and out of this food waste has actually um, a, a pretty big impact. Uh, so this actually touches on several uh, sustainable development goals, the SDGs, which are very close to uh, the UN and FAO, our partner for this event, uh, among which, uh, of course, there is SDG number two, zero hunger, number 12, responsible uh, production and consumption, and number 13, which is around climate actions. Um, so out of this um, topic of food waste and loss, uh, there is one specific subtopic, which is around upcycle food, which is actually taking um, more and more hype. Uh, and there are um, th there is uh, a lot of interest on the topic itself. Um, the, um, um, the the topic of, of today, like the reason of, of getting uh, here with the three uh, guests of these three guests is actually to, to tackle uh, these and to talk about this, um, which is actually very interesting because we're talking about spreading the responsibility across the supply chain, not just around production, but also how the consumers can be more involved uh, into uh, these uh, this, this solutions uh, around food waste. Uh, so today we have these three players with us, which are placed into this movement. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce one of them, um, uh, one of them at the time, and ask a few questions. So first of all, Jonathan, uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, Jonathan uh, Duchess is a professor at the Department of Food and Hospitality Management at Drexel University. Uh, and Jonathan, last September, I actually um, heard of an interview that you gave on PBS. And the topic was around how upcycling discarded ingredients into, um, into food, uh, inserted into food are actually gaining momentum. Uh, so it was very interesting and I, and I feel it will be very uh, important and useful to share a little bit more about this topic and uh, what you think uh, with this audience today. So can you actually explain a little bit more about upcycling as a movement and also the challenges that you see right now? Sure, happy to do that. So um, upcycle, upcycling and upcycled food um, is the process of taking food that would otherwise be wasted and turning it into value added um, food products. Uh, and of course, we know those of us who cook know that this is really just good cooking, right? Food isn't waste until we determine it to be waste. And so for hundreds of years, people have been very good at using um, you know, many parts of the food that is produced uh, and and thrifty cooks and, and chefs are really good at making sure that all of the all of the edible parts of um, a plant or an animal are used. But as we've um, moved forward with our supply chain, um, there's often a lot of waste, things like um, imperfect food or parts of the food that are that are less valued. And often those go to the bottom of the food recovery hierarchy to compost or um, more egregiously to landfill. Um, but, you know, they're often um, perfectly good or even sometimes the better part of the nutrition, um, more nutritious, more, um, more delicious parts of the, of the plant. So, for example, um, often peels uh, are discarded. But any nutritionist will tell you, oh, well, the peel is the most nutritious part of the vegetable, right, in terms of phytonutrients and micronutrients, so uh, and fiber and so on. And so capturing that nutrition, keeping it out of the um, waste stream and keeping it at the top of the food recovery hierarchy is the goal of upcycling. Um, when we started this work a few years ago, it wasn't even really called upcycling as the main industry term. We heard things like salvaged and rescued and repurposed. Um, and at that time, the, the food industry uh, was very skittish about upcycling. Um, there, were, there were sort of two, two main concerns. One was that if they felt that the, um, if consumers were aware that this was food that would otherwise be wasted, 
they would feel like they're eating some sort of second rate or trash food. Uh, and that might be uh, really damaging to a brand or scandalous uh, for the food industry. That was one concern. And the other concern was that if that were to become known, that consumers would expect some sort of discount or um, special you know, um, accommodation. And what we found doing a lot of consumer research and a lot of work with really compelling and, and cool brands is that it's, it's actually quite the opposite. Um, if you educate consumers, and we're not talking about a webinar like this, we're talking about a few words of messaging, um, they will not only accept upcycled foods, but are even willing to pay more for them and think of them closer to a, a, an organic or a better natural, better for the environment, better for you product, and not something to treat with suspicion or uh, expect some sort of, of discount. So it's been an exciting um, field. Interesting. Uh, well, um, yeah, thank you. I think you, you actually touched on a very good point, which was uh, which is around um, yeah, education. And uh, it's, um, it's very interesting to hear that in terms of messaging, actually, the waste that is uh, undervalued actually can become uh, something to price even at higher cost uh, because of all the process that is uh, behind that. Do you have any example of interesting companies uh, yeah. that I think are doing a great job in that? Yeah, um, we actually have uh, one one with us today on this on this panel. Um, but uh, in fall 2019, um, about 10 companies got together to start the Upcycled Food Association, which is at upcycledfood.org. And those were brands who had been doing upcycling, uh, came out of a, a few um, kind of parallel efforts, but um, one was uh, at um, the Food Recovery Forum at Waste Expo, which is a conference for the, the waste industry. Um, we had a panel of upcyclers uh, that I moderated. And, and after the panel, the, the session was over and no one left and everyone said, we should keep up the conversation. We should get together. We have issues in terms of supply chain and consumer education and lobbying. And you know, we have, we have our own specific needs um, as upcyclers. And that, that group together with a few others um, got together to start the Upcycled Food Association. Um, and that was Regrained and uh, Renewal Mill, Matriarch Foods, Shameless Pets, uh, who are all um, uh, TBJ, which is the Bacon Jams. Um, those are our founding members of the Upcycled Food Association, abundantly good um, as well. Um, just over a year later, there are over 160 um, members of the Upcycled Food Association. Uh, and not just um, the kind of cool startup brands, but also multinationals, um, you know, companies like Dole and Mondelez are also represented. So um, I think we've very quickly shown that this is not sort of a, a passing fad or some little corner of the food industry, um, but, is, but is actually um, a concept that makes sense. And, and the reason I think it resonates is we have delicious food products first and foremost. Um, if if the food isn't tasty, and and consumers don't want to eat it, no one no amount of environmental goodness will will make up for that. Um, so they're they're tasty. Um, they're environmentally uh, they make environmental sense, uh, environmentally sound, uh, and they also make business sense. Right where um, you know you started with the sustainable development goals, it's absolutely unthinkable that we have huge levels of food insecurity and hunger at the same time that we have levels of food waste. And upcycling doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't solve climate change any more than having an electric car solves climate change, but it's incrementally better, right? And to the extent that we can chip away at both problems, um, food insecurity, hunger, keeping food in, out of the trash can and in the supply chain, and also, um, you know, um, using more of the food that we're eating and reducing environmental impact. Um, it's, it's a great thing that just makes a lot of sense. And I think we'll see more and more of that from, um, from big food as well, and not just the startup culture. Awesome. Thank you. 
Yeah, um, I'm actually happy to say that we are also very close to the Upcycle Food Association. Future Food Institute actually joined for our uh, R&D activities and the work we do. Um, so yeah, amazing, amazing org organization and amazing group of people would actually lead me to um, Shitao, uh, that I think is a, a perfect representative of, of this. Um, Shital is the co-founder and CEO of Hidden Gems Beverage Companies, which is the organization that launched uh, Reveal Avocado Seed Brew, which is an antioxidant rich beverage made from uh, upcycled uh, avocado seeds. Uh, so Shita, first of all, I should say that um, as an immigrant woman, I am very excited to have you in this panel. Um, and uh, I find your story extremely inspiring. Um, and so I'm very happy that you can share it uh, with the public today. Um, I read um, something you wrote that said, after peeling and pitting a whole case of avocados for guacamole, we ended up with a small bowl of guac, but actually a huge bowl of peels and seeds. And this resonated a lot with many things that I think happened to chefs and to people that cook all the time, uh, that cook all the time. So um, I think it's a very fascinating story. Uh, and I'm sure the audience would have a lot of doubts around how this could actually happen. Like seeds seem very tough, uh, very hard to use. Uh, so it would be great to learn a little bit more about the company, but also what's behind that? What is really happening from a procedure uh, point of view? Yeah. Um, so I was actually in Dr. Jonathan Deutsch's class uh, when I was making that bowl of guacamole. And um, I was also working with him as his research assistant. And, um, you know, I had this huge bowl of peels and seeds. And I was like, OK, I'm calling myself a food waste researcher. Um, what can I do with these? Um, and it so happened that the next class that I had was food analysis. Um, so I went into food analysis. We had to pick an ingredient that was upcycled to like learn more what is like what nutrients are in them so i naturally picked the avocado seed just because it was on top of my mind um and then i found out that they were really full of antioxidants that we actually throw away 95 percent of the antioxidants in an avocado between the seed and the peel and um and i just like started to call local restaurants to find out what everyone did with them I found out that everyone throws them away and they go into the landfill because they don't, they're too hard to get into a commercial composter and they don't compost very well. So I think it was just a combination of the fact that it was so nutritious and also that it's causing so much environmental damage. And it's like, like America's favorite fruit. At so it was just like, what can we possibly do with them? So I did my master's thesis on figuring out how to extract the antioxidants from the avocado to prove that they were safe for human consumption um, and to put it into a format that would be interesting to consumers. And um, I think through the whole process of, you know, trying to figure this out, um, the thing that inspires me the most and makes me really happy about the whole thing is that right now um, avocado seeds you know create greenhouse gases and toxins in a landfill but when they come to us we're able to take them we're able to extract their nutrients they become a really good healthy nutritious drink for our customers um, they contribute to the local economy and um, on top of that they get composted at the end which means that they are now no longer you know, creating greenhouse gases and toxins and coming back to being a part of the ecosystem. And um, that's what really excites me about upcycling and uh, how that just one person asking a question of like, what else can I do with this can actually change everything for everyone um, and change the story. Wow, super, super interesting. And so when, and this is like a question that comes from someone that lives in California, and we are eating a lot of avocados all the time. So what would you suggest to normal like to normal consumers that are consuming a lot of avocados? Like what do what should people do with with the seeds and the peels? Yeah, uh, the peels are really easy. You can compost them. Um, they also make for really good like hair masks and skin um, masks. They have a lot of like uh, antioxidants and they also have a lot of the fatty acids in them. So they do make really good uh, skincare, like DIY skincare at home. Um, and with the seeds, they're really hard to compost. So um, if you do have a composting 
option. Um, I would suggest that you stick them, like stick them in your freezer for until you have like a big batch. You can use those to make like a dye if you would like um, to dye any fabrics that you want. Um, and then if you don't want to dye your fabrics. Um, after you're done, you're able to compost them. Just sticking them in water for a while, like boiling water for half an hour will soften them enough uh, to allow them to compost. Wow, thank you. Yeah, you're thank welcome. You. Thank you. Um, right, and so the third person in this um, in this session is actually um, someone very close to Future Food, which is uh, Stephen Finn. Uh, Steve is um, actually is, uh, has two hats, I would say here, is an affiliated faculty at the University of Pennsylvania and also a VP of uh, Food Waste Prevention at LeanPath, which is a global leader in helping commercial kitchens prevent food waste um, thanks to smart technology. Welcome, Steve. Thanks, Kara. Um, so, you are living both the academic and the corporate world, and right now I think we spoke with uh, um, with kind of like both, but as also from like a startup perspective. So I would like to dive a little bit more into what happens at LeanPath, which is a bigger company and you work with uh, major corporations. Um, and um, I would like to know, why did you, um, why did you start uh, working with commercial kitchens? So if you can share a little bit more around the problem in the commercial kitchen settings um, and why is LeanPath like going, decided to go um for uh, like measure like the measurement round route so like using a lot of technology so like how is this empowering chefs in commercial kitchens to actually waste less sure well thank you Kira. and I, I love what Jonathan and Sheetal are doing it's it's wonderful work uh, in upcycled foods um yeah the, the work at lean path it, you know the is 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 we um think about this you know the work in com uh, commercial kitchens is really important because you know these these are organizations that are serving you know, hundreds of millions of meals around the globe daily, right? And so these are big companies that have really deep supply chains. They purchase vast quantities of food. Uh, they have the ability to reduce food waste in their operations. They can educate and change behavior among their employees, um, and also they have a chance to educate their patrons, right? The consumer, um, you know, further demonstrating responsibility in their operations. And and obviously we know. Uh, a lot of waste occurs at the consumer level too. And so it's important for them to touch the consumer in workplaces and food service or uh, institutional settings too. Um, so, you know, due to their volume, they can re they're really positioned to move the needle on global food waste reduction, right? So we really need food service organizations to step up on food waste reduction. Um, and measurement is a key way to do that, right? They need to set targets, they need to commit to measurement and they need to commit to action, right? So. It's, it's really easy to make commitments, but it's essential to act and to track progress against um, your commitments, right? So we talk about this in terms of closing the commitment gap, uh, and that's a really important thing to do to uh, demonstrate authenticity, because you know, as we know, what you measure, you manage, right? So organizations that are measuring uh, a problem are going to you know, address it uh, in a better manner. So you know, at LeanPath, we really realize the need to for transparent measurement to um, establish a baseline level of food waste, to assess progress against it, and to guide interventions, um, you know, in the in the work to reduce um, food waste. So, and it's more than just operational change; it's also, uh, importantly, about behavior change too. So, um, we view food service organizations as really having a great opportunity um, to address food waste um, at all levels of the hierarchy, right? Um, and we all know we're at a, this inflection point in the food system right now, so it's really essential for them to step up and lead. So um, they can do that with a holistic approach, uh, which is really in, impactful. So at LeanPath, we provide this measurement focused technology that enables them to track and measure each case of food waste in their operations every day. Uh, we capture the data from each of those transactions in a cloud-based database. Um, and that allows them to go and analyze um, those transactions for operational changes, not only to reduce food waste in the short term, but also to prevent it going forward, which is really important. And then we supplement that with coaching going forward. Um, and so through this process, organizations can reduce their food purchasing costs, their labor costs, their utilities costs, and their disposal costs. There's a lot that's really attractive about this, right? And then kind of a side piece of this is, you know, throughout this process, it's really important to realize the power of the food service worker, right? They're on the front lines, they're preparing millions of meals daily. So it's important to connect them to the food waste challenge 
and ensure that they understand the, the role that they can play in it. And so beyond the prevention aspect, um, they can then uh, engage in downstream recovery aspects. So we enable that, you know, they can engage in donation partnerships, both for people and animals. Um, they can engage in composting and they can partner with upcycled food uh, operations, for example, you know, and take their byproducts and, and help turn those into value added products that, um, you know, will help them advance their climate and their circularity goals. So um, huge opportunities here. A lot of it involves, you know, just, just focusing on food as a resource. And, you know, and lastly, they can, they can also push food waste reduction through their supply chains to have further impact as well. Yeah, thank you. That's like, it seems like knowing is kind of like crucial for changing without knowing it's, it's very hard to know what to change, right? Yeah, um, so important, know, yeah. yeah exactly. I, I would be curious to know which are the main challenges that you see with working with companies, like which are the main blockers that big food service operators are actually stuck into? Yeah, some of those, you know, especially right now, there's a, we talk about a finite pool of worry, right? Organizations have only so many things that they can prioritize and focus on at one time. And um, so you need to navigate through that a little bit um, and, and demonstrate the value of food waste prevention um, to help them in, in so many ways, right? To help them meet their climate goals or circularity goals, to help them reduce costs, to help them engage um, stakeholders, to help them demonstrate responsibility. So there's just tremendous advantages to it. Um, but you just, again, you have to kind of battle through all of the other things that they are focused on. Um, and you have to do a little educating on just you know, the value of food waste prevention. Not everybody um, knows all of the, um, you know, the details related to cost reduction, the environmental benefits, although it's second nature to all of us who work in this space every day, but there's still a big education um, process to, uh, to do as you're, as you're talking with, with clients and consumers, but that's, that's getting a little easier. Yeah, totally. And this is actually a follow-up question for for all of you. Like we we spoke about upcycling, like what uh, is supposed to like it used to be called waste, but actually uh, reinserting it into the uh, supply chain. We spoke about education and we spoke about measurement. Is there anything else when it comes to fighting food waste, which is actually a big pie? Is there anything uh, else that you think it would be very uh, interesting to mention? Um, for the audience in terms of approaches to solutions? I'll, I'll throw one out there and, and Jonathan and Shido can, can maybe um, build on it because they're they're close to this too. But, you know, one of the things uh, historically that we found in, in, at Lean Path is, um, is making this a safe conversation in the workplace, right? Chefs are, uh, you know, their role is to, to prepare delicious food and to do that um, efficiently and, and, and responsibly, right? And so, for a lot, for for decades, um, you know, food waste hasn't been necessarily a safe uh, space uh, to you know for conversation uh, in in food service settings, and it also you know food waste hasn't been extremely visible, right? We we refer to this as the elephant in the kitchen at times, and so there's a there's a little bit of an issue here in terms of making it a safe conversation space and and you know uh, allowing people to engage and to um, to embrace that transparency and that measurement aspect that we talked about uh, and to embrace the visibility uh, and typically as, as we all know I think uh, good things come from transparency and measurement but um, Jonathan and, and Shido might have some comments on that. Can I go? Sure. Okay um, I was going to say that um, one of the challenges that we face as a really small company looking to acquire avocado seeds, which mostly everyone throws away. Um, the first set of, you know, uh, the reactions that we get is like, oh, you mean, you mean the avocado pulp, like, or like frozen avocado. And I'm like, no, 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 I actually want the seed. And they're like, oh, we don't have that. And I'm like, no, yes, you do. Um, so there's like that first little bit of education that goes on with like, I actually want the part that you're throwing away. And immediately after we started that uh, conversation, it was just like, they were like, oh yeah, we would love to, but then they would ask us all these questions that we didn't have the answers to. It's like, how do you want them to be processed? How do you want them to be cleaned? How do you want them to be packaged? How many seeds can I fit into a pallet? 
into a box? How many boxes can I fit on a pallet? Like how should they be transported? How much is this pallet gonna weigh? Um, and there's just a lot of information that really doesn't exist for a lot of upcycled ingredients. And a lot of upcycled companies have to go through a lot to get to something which like somebody else would be able to order a case of avocados and everything has already been figured out like by somebody else. Um, but a lot of companies have to do that on their own, which I think is a really fascinating part of um, what upcycle companies go through. That's great. I want to I want to follow up on um, something Steve said about the kind of the safety of having of engaging with this topic. So um, while food waste is a is a big global problem, uh, a huge proportion of it happens at the home level. Um, so you know professionals yes there's there's waste um but it, in at the industrial level um there there are certainly ways to improve um but there there's incentive to um to to be pretty efficient uh at the home level um we're seeing tremendous amounts of waste and that's partly a, an education issue um and it's just partly a, a kind of framing issue so um and and Sheetal's story is a great example of of what we try to do when we when we teach um, food waste minimization and prevention is really to think about the the uh, the potentialities of the food. So just just as people practice some mindfulness and mindful eating, we can also practice mindful cooking. And and so for for home consumers, um, you know, certainly buy upcycled foods, ask for upcycled foods, look for upcycled foods. But also think about your own upcycling and your own practice, right? Whether it's um, you know broccoli leaves and stems, or you know a, a part of a fruit that that has a bruise, you know, and and the the sort of path of least resistance may just be to put that in the compost. You know, take a minute, be mindful about it, trim it. You know, see what what could really be done with this. Is it really bad just because it's bruised? And if so. What about the rest of it? You know, um, and and that's really worked. Um, just as sort of a reminder to look for those opportunities. Yeah, and just building on what Jonathan said, I, I think you know we're in this culture of abundance around food, right? It it comes very easy to us. Um, it surrounds us. It's relatively inexpensive. Um, it's easy for you know we like big portions. Um, it's easy for us to buy a lot of food uh, often, and it is. Uh, you know, relatively inexpensive to discard it too, and that's a bad combination, right? So, as a result, um, you know, we waste a lot very easily, and we, you know, we reinforce uh, this kind of costly cycle of overproduction, right, and excessive waste, right? We overproduce, we discard a lot of food, and then we produce more to replace it, right? And so, and we don't think about uh, this too much um, in the process, and that's that's really important. Uh, we we need to change that, as Jonathan said, we need to get the consumer to be more mindful. Uh, break that culture of abundance, and that's why I think you know uh, this this upcycled food movement is so exciting because it it just um, it gets right at that, and it gets right to the value of food and the the ways that you can use it. And there's so many elements of creativity and fun and innovation and learning that um, you can't help but be inspired by all of the stories that are involved. So I really uh, am very uh, very hopeful for the role of the upcyclers like Sheetal and Jonathan and all this great work they're doing to really help change this uh, this very wasteful cultural abundance that we have. The, the other thing to mention is um, just today um, it was announced that there is now a certification for upcycled food products uh, that could go on a package or a label. So um, beyond um, trying to navigate this world as a consumer, consumers can specifically look uh, in the coming months, look for the certified upcycle, upcycled logo on a package uh, and ask retailers to stock uh, upcycled products. So that's a really exciting uh, moment for this movement. Awesome, wow, yes. So I think we actually have a bunch of um, action items and things to suggest to people in the audience from uh, measuring more and using technology to measure, to be more open to education and uh, acknowledging that this is actually a topic and being less scared uh, to talk about food waste as, as Steve was suggesting. Uh, the certification I think is something 
amazing, wonderful, that will make uh, people's lives very easier, uh, very much easier when uh, consuming and buying products. Uh, and I also definitely like the mindful cooking in addition to mindful eating that I think is actually a very cool um, input to give to all the consumers uh, that are listening to us. So with this, I think the, the time is over and I want to thank um, Sheetal, uh, Jonathan and Steve for the time that uh, you spent with us and with the audience. And I'm going to uh, lead it to the next panel. Uh, which is going to be around food and climate voices from Dominican Republic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tiara. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Hello and welcome to the Future Food Institute Food for Earth Day 2021. This is the Global Torch Relay for positivity, goodness, and hope pertaining to the future of food. We have about a 45 minute roundtable discussion here with a few different uh, food thought leaders, entrepreneurs, uh, scientists from around the world. And we are going to discuss what gives us hope for the future of food. So uh, I'd like to bring up uh, the three uh, panelists here. Uh, the first one is Donega Felice Markegaard. She is a grass-fed beef researcher, uh, rancher and researcher and land steward uh, from the Markegaard family ranch. Uh, welcome, Donega. So nice to have you. Thank you for your time. Uh, also, we have Andrea Baricelli, uh, one of my favorite Italians. He's a psychologist and neuroscientist, and he is uh, sort of, uh, in my understanding, quantifying and qualifying our connectedness with nature and a biophiliac. Welcome, Andrea. And last but not Coffee. least, the Coffee. one and only Rob Trice who is one of the most connected men in uh, the Silicon Valley, California, actually really global food tech, uh, ag tech ecosystem. He is founding partner at Better Food Ventures and the Mixing Bowl Hub. Uh, welcome, Rob. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. So my name is Tim West. I'll be your host, um, kind of uh, cat herding this wonderful conversation of all of the things that are giving us hope. Uh, I'm a slow food chef turned social entrepreneur and co-founder of the Future Food Institute, but really at the end of the day, I'm a student of the food system and a collector of really great people doing great things in the world. So I'm honored to be able to join you and to be tapped by Sarah Reversi from Future Food to talk about our theme today uh, pertaining to this future food of regeneration, nature tech, and biophilia. So in rough order, uh, I'm going to ask uh, each of our panelists here to speak to these themes, but we may have a bunch of uh, conversations back and forth. So anybody welcome to jump in whenever. Donega, uh, I'd love to start with you and kind of invite you to give us a little bit of your background, how you arrived at your work uh, and speak to this theme of regeneration. Please, the stage is yours. Great. Thank you, Tim. Uh, it's an honor to share the stage with all of you. And uh, my um, my background is in wildlife tracking, permaculture, and wilderness survival. But that really has led me to my current work, which is a regenerative rancher here in the California coast. Um, we uh, graze uh, grass-fed beef, grass-fed lamb, pasture-raised pork, and pasture-raised chicken on 11,000 acres of um, coastal grasslands. And we do this through regenerative agriculture um, so that the there is more life uh, that is produced with this form of ranching. And it's really ranching in nature's image and how the prairie would, um, would, would be grazed and how the, uh, the prairie evolved with grazing animals. So, um, the the reason why i uh got got into this was uh because um i i talk about it in my in my memoir my, my first memoir dawn again tracking the wisdom of the wild um i was uh you know, what you might call an at-risk youth, um, runaway teenager, and I found the wilderness because I was searching for something, searching for meaning in a very disconnected world. And I wanted to, um, 
connect with myself. And I did that by connecting with nature. So I spent time, um, you know, going out with just a pocket knife and making a shelter, gathering food and, um, tracking animals, collecting wild plants, and immersing in my senses. And so when we immerse in our senses, and I think Andrea um, will speak more to this, and we're immersed in nature, then um, we were able to absorb uh, so many different signals and connect to sort of that that sacred silence that's within us all. So by connecting with nature, um, inherently it brings about a curiosity, a curiosity for life, a curiosity for connection and relationships. And often that curiosity leads to a path passion, that you're passionate about something. And that passion leads to a greater vision of how we can all play a role in the larger ecology and framework of this incredible planet that we're celebrating today. So I learned about regenerative agriculture um, from that place, from that place of immersion. I was uh, would spend my summers in my youth uh, tracking wolves in um, the largest tract of wilderness in the um, lower 48 states. And uh, it was on one occasion where I was uh, following an alpha wolf and he led me to a rendezvous site where the pack had had gathered and they were uh, they were feeding on a bull elk that they had just taken down. And it was one of those experiences that you'll remember the rest of your life because you know, you, the the hair on the back of my neck was standing up and I just felt so alive from connecting with that wolf and being immersed in that wilderness alone. And also sort of on that edge of, that edge of fear um, and being able to surrender to that, that trust that I was gonna be okay. Um, and so it was this uh, rendezvous site that really taught me about that relationship of predator and prey, that when the predators move through a landscape, they're moving the herds of the prey animals. So in this case, it was the elk. The herds of elk would move from meadow to meadow and the wolves would follow them and uh, take down one wolf or take down one elk and, and feast on that elk. But after the elk had moved through, it was like the meadow had become alive. Uh, they had trampled the plants. They had left their saliva. They had uh, wallowed. They had sort of hydrated the landscape, like this, this dance of... Um, prey and and plants and this this has actually been been studied extensively um, in in Yellowstone National Park it's called the trophic cascade where when a predator comes into a landscape in that case the wolf um, then everything moves so the predator moves the prey so instead of the the elk hanging around those riparian areas and just grazing in one spot um, and sort of becoming lazy those predators move those animals and then in turn the plants really thrive and what they saw was the songbirds came back and the beaver came back so that is really what brought me to my work today is that I found that the way nature functions creates all this life. And we've really messed things up. <laughs> but if we can take our place and start to tend to that wild and work with nature and let her then uh, regenerate because that's what she's really good at. That's what Mother Earth is really good at is regeneration. And so it's not enough just to 
walk away because we belong here too and we have a place so uh after i realized that the 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 predator moving those elk and moving those prey species were vital to the health of not only that elk population but also all of the plants and all of the species and when that ecology is in place then there's biodiversity there's abundance of life and there's species that that come back and flourish so there's no ecologically intact ecosystem devoid of animals so if we're going to practice regenerative agriculture and we're going to talk about mimicking nature then we need to immerse ourselves and really understand nature and be a part of nature and understand our role so that's why i always uh tell people that the foundation you know what you should be uh bringing your kids to and where you should be focusing before you can even begin to think about regenerative agriculture is get to know your place get to know all of the plants get to know the birds get to know the the animals and how everything relates in a symbiotic way and get to know the historic ideal how the indigenous people stewarded that land and they lived in this balance where their actions created their own survival and the survival of all of the life that they depended on. So how can we then look at that historic ideal? So here where I live, it's grasslands. Like grasslands are incredible. They cover 40% of the earth's surface and they have so much potential to draw down carbon because grasses, they continue to grow, especially perennial grasses. So when we enhance these grasslands, then we pull more carbon down from the atmosphere, we create more life, and we create nutrient-dense food for humans. Um, so that's why I love grass-fed beef. I think people need to eat more grass-fed beef. And I see my role as a regenerative rancher um, similar to how uh, nature functions is that I move because nature moves. So I need to move with nature. So as a regenerative rancher, I move my animals. I move my herds of cattle through the grasslands. And in turn, those cattle move the grasses and all of those plants. They're trampling, they're biting, uh, they're helping to um, to create the, that germination of those seeds. They're fertilizing uh, by spreading their manure. And, uh, and then they move on and those grasses grow and all of that green leaf uh, pulls down carbon through photosynthesis and that then moves the soil. So that's really where that sweet spot is, is that by grazing in this way, we're producing more biodiversity above ground, which leads to biodiversity below ground. And the healthier the soil is, the healthier all of us are, the healthier our food is, um, and the, the more drought resilient our landscapes are because all of that soil organic matter um, that is built when soil is covered, when those basic regenerative agriculture principles are followed, that holds more moisture. So we need to get away from those industrial agriculture models and start to ranch and farm in nature's image and bring more life and it's it's possible it's possible because what we're seeing on these rangelands is is stunning we're seeing so much carbon being drawn down we're seeing an increase in native perennial bunch grasses we're seeing an increase in threatened uh grassland birds i was just out all day yesterday with the audubon society and uh looking at 
you know, the grasslands are the solution for so many of these species that are holding on by a thread. And the people, groups like the Audubon Society are looking at grass-fed ranchers and saying, okay, your form of agriculture of producing food is not tilling the prairie. It's not contributing to monocultures of corn and soy. It's not producing releasing carbon in the atmosphere because the soil is being covered. It's not creating habitat loss. It's increasing habitat. And it's looking at how the indigenous people steward this land and mimicking as much as we can in a very humble way um, to start to regain those carbon stocks and that water storage that once existed in these grasslands. And so that's what really excites me about this day right now, this Earth Day, is that there's so much talk about regenerative agriculture. I've been on so many different panels and um, it's, it's real and it gives us hope. And we can see certain, um, uh, certain examples where this does work. And if we scale this, this, this will work. It's gonna take a lot of, a lot of uh, partnerships, but I, I do see a lot of hope. So please uh, stay in touch. I'm really honored to be on this panel with all of you. And um, yeah, happy, happy day. And let's let make this the start of a really positive future where we can regenerate life with every action we take and stop trying to tame the wild. Let's tend to the wild. Wow. Wow. Donaga, thank you. I um I could do 24 hours on just hearing you talk and, and about your passion. What I am hearing is this sensory immersion uh, really brought you to uh, wildlife where wildlife became your teacher and now you've become uh, the teacher uh, and are using these grasslands to produce uh, a food product in a regenerative manner. Um, and wow, that, that surely piques my curiosity. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I'd love to shift over to Andrea, somebody else who's deeply connected to nature, um, a, a biophiliac, uh, a term uh, referring to a human desire to commune with nature. Uh, we've spent some time up in the Italian Alps together, and uh, I know you're an avid runner, you're a scientist, you've put um, really interesting sensors on uh, on people's heads as they've been eating and connecting and communing with nature. I'm curious uh, what gives you hope and, and uh, what you're working on these days uh, that you'd love to share on, on this wonderful Earth Day. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, it's good to remember that days. So we had a lot of fun uh, here in the Italian Alps. And uh, um, I would start uh, thinking about uh, really biophilia. Biophilia is the, the passion or, or the interest that we have uh, about life, life in general. I mean, plants, trees, animals, other humans. So it's a sort of instinct that everyone has. So inside of us, there is something that is evolved in these ages that connect us to everything. And what I mean everything is really everything because we are living in a very complex era. And uh, uh, today, more than other, uh, in the other uh, periods of life, we have the possibility to embrace or try to understand this kind of complexity. So humans are little dots in this uh, little world in the universe, but we are all connected to everything. So the question is how we can understand what is our role in this story, how we can understand what are the connection between us and planet Earth or the nature in general, or how many tools we have to try to understand that. So we started uh, 15 years ago uh, by trying to understanding humans. Uh, it's not easy, uh, definitely not easy. That's because humans are super complex in machine, even our brains, but we started using uh, EEG devices. So they are neuroimaging tools that through the soul sensors that are placed on your scalp, 
we can see the communication of your neurons, so your thoughts, your emotions, your brain processes. But the big question is not just what kind of processing are running in your brain when you are trying something or eating some food or doing a sports activity, but what are really the futures that affects your brain? What are really the context? Is the context matter? Yes. How is the relationship between a specific environment uh, features and your reaction. Can we try to understand what is this kind of connection? So I started, for example, really some years ago by using uh, stupid uh, data loggers measuring humidity, lights, temperature, and everything just by hanging in my hands, trying to understand if the variation of some of these measurements affects humans' reaction in a specific condition. And given by time, Today, we have the possibility by using this kind of devices to measure not just your brain's reaction, but try to understand how the context, how the environment are going to affect your brain and specifically on the topic, how nature benefits your brain, how you can, for some ways, uh, be in connection with that. So we started uh, three years ago uh, just for research by measuring people while they are doing something. Uh, okay, no, sorry. I saw a question in the chat. Okay, that's fine. Is that, is, every, is uh, everything okay? Uh, you're a little choppy for me. I don't know if there's any way to get closer to your router. Uh, I find your work fascinating and I'd love to have a clearer way to hear it. Is that fine for the others? Okay, I can go ahead. Yeah, I think so. Um, if, if there's anything you can do to close some windows to maybe get a better uh, signal, maybe would be the best thing to do. Oh, God. Apologies for the technical difficulties here. Andrea, now you're muted, by the way. Let's unmute you. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, sorry, guys. Yeah, no, I'm saying that living in the woods is funny and uh, good for your health, but it's not for uh, internet connection, probably. So sorry about that, if you can hear me in some points. But anyhow, uh, we were uh, just by trying to understand the complexity and how we can measure that. So we started record group of people that come out and stay in nature. Uh, we've done in different places, not just here in Italy, but even, uh, okay, that's fine. Uh, not just here in Italy, but even in other places. So we've done in Madagascar, we've been in Kenya, in Asia, in North America, and even in California too. And for example, uh, when we've been in Madagascar, uh, we uh, measure people why they are where in the forest, a non anthropitized forest, so a very wild place, we observed that people after the uh, 60 minutes, so in the first part of the journey, they are really scared in some points, their brain are wondering, okay, what's gonna happen? Is something that are gonna kill me, beat me or everything? But after one hour, so 60 minutes, this kind of cognitive uh, workload or overload collapsed and the brain started saying, okay, you are at home now. There is nothing that are gonna scare you so long. So you can start brief. You can start to appreciate this kind of environment and the engagement and the relaxing skyrocketing going up incredibly faster. So after one hour, we call it totally adaptive to a very wide place like a forest with snakes and everything. So this is really fascinating because it means that our brain, our machines, are totally connected, even with these ancient and uh, uh, ancient roots and ancient uh, environments. So we starting to on uh, this lane to try to say, okay, let us see what's really happening. People is going into into nature, so even other wild places, and um, we try to uh, analyze a specific kind of intelligence of the people. That's because you know they have multiple. Uh, the shades of intelligence. We have one, this is the naturalistic intelligence. So is your uh, capability to be not just fascinated, but in contact uh, to treat 
the naturalistic uh, things. So to appreciate nature in general, not of all, uh, not of us, not all of us are uh, uh, in contact with this kind of intelligence. So we need to educate or try to understand people how they can be in contact and educated to be in contact with nature. So one, as Donica said, probably curiosity is the first stages of this kind of journey. So we need to put people in contact with nature. That's because the curiosity needs to the knowledge. So once I've been in contact with something which is unknown to me, I start wondering and asking to myself, okay, what kind of feature is that one? What kind of plant? What kind of tree? What kind of benefit? Or what kind of feeling is that one that is rushing into me while I walk in this kind of woods? And uh, you can't love or take care about something that you don't know. So if you want that people are in contact and try to keep and preserving this planet, we need to put the people in contact with nature. So once they know something, probably start to arise into you the feeling to protect and to love something. So our uh, our job today is to use our tools to one understand the benefits that connect and comes from nature to human beings, and use this kind of tool to gently nudge the people to be in contact with nature, to be outside by explaining what kind of benefits they has stay in contact with nature, but more than this, to use this data to uh, policymakers, governments, and everyone that today need to take decisions. Today, they need data. They need uh, very reliable and uh, solid data to take decisions. If I'm going to invest such money today, it's better if I take one uh, decision that go into the direction to one to the planet, the second to help the people. So today our journey is try to work in to create this super large matrix of data, this super large database of human beings and nature, and try by using this kind of data to be predictive and go into this direction. Is there some questions? Yes. <laughs> Uh, I'm hoping that this is coming through better for the recording than it is for me. Maybe it's partially my uh, audio, but um, I'm actually well, I'm, I'm understanding Andrea just fine. I'm not having any okay, issues. Okay, yeah, great. Maybe oh, can nice. I chime in a little bit? Please do. Okay. Oh yeah, sure. I, Andrea, I mean, I just I think uh, what you're doing is really cool, and I think I think about COVID and how that caused, I think, everyone to really appreciate getting access to the outdoors and the greenery much, much more, including government officials, right? And that they, we talk about the nature deficit disorder. And I think that that, you know, I, oh. I, I'm i actually Donica's neighbor in, in uh, the little town of Pescadero, mm -hmm. California. And we, I'm sure she would feel the same that we had access to tons of land where we could be by ourselves we didn't even have to wear masks because six feet we didn't have to worry about social distancing because we're we have more animals than humans where we live and uh i so i, I think that that's that's really important i also just i wanted to say something about um donica's biophiliac kids um because you know she raises her kids in a very natural environment and she's got these wonderful kids that just are full of purity and, and positivity and passion. And uh, you can see that benefit of them having access to the outdoors and the way that Donica and her husband, Eric, raise those kids out in nature and the benefits that they see from that. Yeah. So yeah. I, I had one, I had uh, one more thought. Uh, oh, go ahead, Andrea. No, yeah. I. I and uh, I had the pleasure to be in Donegas Ranch last year. Uh, we have, we've been guests even for dinner. Uh, they didn't make me work, so it's it's nice. Uh, but I encountered even the, the kids and the, even the atmosphere. As you said, you can appreciate directly, but just by looking at the guys, the benefits that they had to be in contact with nature and has this kind of lifestyle. So. When you, when you say that people after COVID, they feel uh, instinctively to go outside the state in nature, 
Is that because probably they know that going in nature is the best way to heal, best way to try to gently uh, shut up some kind of thoughts, to shut up some kind of feelings, but they didn't know probably how to be in contact really or deeply with nature. So it's a, a good tentative integrally reaction, but we probably today we need to lead the people to go more out, to discover more, to treat more with nature. So it's good because you saw that people instantly go out, but probably the, the uh, largest part of them, they didn't appreciate totally the real benefits to stay out in nature. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they are not uh, good for that. They are totally good. They had good time and so forth, but probably they didn't understand completely what kind of benefit, what kind of, if you do regularity, this kind of connection is going for you. So that's the role yeah. of a company like ours and guys like you to say, okay, guys, it's good. Let me explain what, what, what you can do more for that. And why for that reason is this kind of benefit. Yeah. Well, Tim, you wanted me to talk a little bit about nature tech, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, just to respond briefly, though, to Andrea, one of the things I find so fascinating, it feels like you're quantifying the quality of nature and and qualifying the value of a forest in place, which is a, a kind of really interesting development because we can say a, a forest uh, cut down in wood is so much money, but you're now being able to say that it, it has tremendous value to us as it sits in nature. So that gives me a tremendous amount of hope and, and is just fascinating work. So thank you so much for sharing what you're up to. And yes, uh, Rob Trice, uh, I know you could talk uh, for hours about this type of stuff. Um, so please bring it home for us. Tell, uh, tell us a little bit about what gives you hope uh, as far as the future food pertaining to nature tech. Well, on a nature tech, you know, the term itself could be a bunch of different things and uh, kind of link this back to Andrea a little bit. Um, uh, Donica, I don't know if you know, but we have 820 visiting goats. Uh, and so so this weekend I had to help out with the goats. And as weird as this sounds, there is a calm, you know, this Donica hanging out with the animals. So being amongst a herd of 820 goats. I still don't understand goat yoga, but hanging out with a herd of goats, there's a calmness that comes to it. It's the same thing with the cows. It's just when you, you're out there, I think my, maybe Andrea, if you get over that initial fear of what the animals are and you understand that you can coexist with them and there's a mutually beneficial, beneficial relationship. So that's kind of tying into and Andrea, but then also the reason that we have those goats there is that they are nature tech in the sense that last year we had a fire that came within three quarters of a mile of the ranch. And we're actually using those goats for fire mitigation purposes. So we're sending them up into the brush that we have to clear them out, uh, clear out that brush and um, help prevent uh, any potential forest fires reaching that ranch. So that's kind of one that's probably not exactly what, when you wanted me to talk about nature tech, goats is probably not what you had in mind, Tim. Um, so maybe what I can do is just give a little bit of background on myself and my focus areas. So the the community that Don and I live in is 45 minutes west of Silicon Valley. My background uh, is about 15 years in mobile internet telecom venture capital. And uh, I actually met Tim at an event eight years ago called Hack Meet. Uh, and it was a hackathon that my wife dragged me to, to look at how we could use technology for beef. And uh, long story short, uh, my team actually ended up winning that hackathon. We won $5,000 and a car hard jacket and a box of meat. And uh, I, I ended up with my picture on the cover of Modern Farmer magazine, somewhere my parents never thought they would ever see me. Um, but I kind of looked at it and I looked at the challenges of food. I looked at the fact that um, Uber had disrupted transportation, Airbnb had disrupted lodging. Food and agriculture is five to 10% of the world's economy. Incredibly important. I don't know a single person who doesn't want to eat. Um, and yet it's got tremendous challenges that we need to go solve. And so at that point, eight years ago, Silicon Valley's IT innovation ecosystem hadn't really embraced food and ag tech. And uh, so, Tim, 
you came to our very first conference that we had for the Mixing Bowl, which was in 2014, seven years ago. And I put a slide on, on the screen and I said, the Mixing Bowl's purpose is fourfold. There's four ways that we're gonna solve the challenges of food and ag. First, we need to see the issues. Second, we need to see the solutions. Third, we need to solve the problems. And fourth, we need to scale the solutions. And now if we fast forward, the thing that gives me hope and excitement is that as opposed to seven or eight years ago, where we didn't even know what agro food tech was, and we hardly had any entrepreneurs, any funding in this space. Now you look and we've got arguably too many entrepreneurs moving into food tech and ag tech. We've got a ton of dollars stepping in globally. Like this space has lit up. It's become a thing. Uh, Donica was featured in a movie called Kiss the Ground. Whoever would have thought that soil would be trending on Netflix, right? This has all happened in the last seven years. Soil is sexy. And so there's been a great awareness of the challenges that we have and the opportunities. And so where I look at my role is I want to bring that technology and particularly that data technology to inform us on those natural solutions and how can we actually implement them better. And so uh, earlier this year, we released a report that we did alongside the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers in Action, uh, World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and our friends at the Croatan Institute to look at how we could actually scale up um, climate smart ag practices for soil health in the United States, ultimately to get U.S. agriculture to become a net positive carbon sink. And so we looked at uh, how we could really um, help farmers and ranchers embrace six key practices and use technology and finance to transition, uh, to embrace and transition on these practices. So the six practices we looked at were no one reduced tillage, cover cropping, crop rotation, compost, managed grazing, and integrated crop and livestock systems. And the other thing that we did we looked at the fact that, you know, when we did these interviews for farmers and ranchers, we kept hearing this term, I took a leap of faith. For whatever reason, I took a leap of faith and I embraced these practices. And what we want to do is, is use technology and finance to make that leap of faith a shorter hop. And so that ultimately farmers can know that they've got the technical advice to go implement these practices su successfully and that there will be economic reward for embracing these practices. And I know, for instance, Tim, our, our mutual friend, Etro Paul and Sarah Roversi started the Food for Climate League, which is also undertaking an important element, which is under making sure that we that consumers have the narratives and the stories related to climate smart foods so that they do buy those regenerative food products that are coming out, that they're willing to pay for the full cost of food. They're willing to pay a premium for those products being produced by farmers and ranchers that are being done uh, according to the principles of, of climate smart soil centric agriculture. So that was the goal that we undertook. There are definitely challenges, but I think at the end of the day, I remain hopeful. You know, we what we also did in this report is we outlined the agriculture capital flows in the United States. There's a $972 billion that flows through the United, almost a trillion dollars that goes through the agricultural system in the United States every year, only about 20 billion of that is US government. So if you think about supplier agreements, you think about insurance, you think about banking, uh, equipment purchases, all of this is flowing through the, the ag system in the United States. How can we look to grow the pie? How can we assign more of that money to climate smart agricultural practices? We can do this. The science behind these practices is valid. A USDA scientists all over the world know that these practices work. What now the role that the data th can play though is, you know, the practices that uh, my wife at Tomcat Ranch or Donica will do it on the Marky Guy where they're grazing. The way that you're going to manage those um, uh, adaptive rotational grazing plans is going to be different than how you might do it in Georgia but it might be more similar to the way that you would do it in Western Australia, because we're lacking water, particularly this year, we're, we're about 50% of our normal average rainfall. 
Georgia, they may have plenty of water. And so we need to make sure that the producers like Donaga have the right information so that they know how best to implement, whether that is where to graze, how to graze, what to plant, um, and so forth. So how can we actually use the data to inform people? Right now, there's there are a ton of things like Facebook groups, understanding ag, where farmers are connecting. I don't know how anybody did agriculture before YouTube. This is a use of technology right now, but we can do much better. And we can really use this big data, AI, machine learning, all of those buzzwords to better understand how things are being done, collect those stories of where we're seeing success or failure, the amount of birds that you're seeing in Donaga's place versus our place. How can we determine like is a, the planting of a certain um, perennial crop bringing more of a certain bird back um, more frequently, um, better water capture, water quality, uh, carbon capture, all of these things. We have the capacity to harness all of the technology we have over the hill in Silicon Valley to benefit food and agriculture. So I think maybe just in, in summation, if I think about why I have hope on this Earth Day, while the challenges are great, the opportunities are great as well, we've got the resources. This is global. This is a ton of entrepreneurs. We've had the entire conservation community really focusing on food and ag. That was not the case seven years ago. I think there's a better recognition of the value of working landscapes as another nature tech climate solution that is coming along. We have Wall Street uh, that has now got, you know, one third of institutional money in the United States is related to SCG or ESG now. And so you're looking at the application of big Wall Street money to projects that that meet their financial goals, but that are also aligned with the SDG goals. And so all of these things, this is what gives me great hope. And and of course, we've got climate change happening. And so there's there's a need for us all to focus on this together. I think you did a really great job at tying that up there, Rob. Um, yeah, and, and actually, I, one of the Rob-isms comes to mind, and, and it, it actually brings me back to my own origin story of getting into food was coming from getting food poisoning from fast food, from that old system, uh, that, that extractive nutrient void system. And that's what really inspired my own journey into the slow food movement and, and then into the entrepreneurial world. But there wasn't that entrepreneurial ecosystem when we met 10 years ago. Now, as you said, there is a tremendous amount of entrepreneurs out there. There's a tremendous amount of information on what the challenges and the opportunities are. There's a lot of solutions that are finally being funded. But the future of food, to borrow your term, uh, I like you know what you just said. It's fast. And it's fast flows of information, uh, of feedback systems, of getting to understand you know, what really is the value, what is working, but it's really going back to the basics. It's pairing slow food with technology. And I, I kind of want to just wrap up by saying that the thing that gives me the most hope is first of all, you guys, and, and it is the other folks that are watching around the world that are tapped into the Future Food Network. We have this global community beyond borders uh, all around the world that actively care about this. And, and also what you mentioned, this unifying force of climate change. And I work a lot with uh, big food companies trying to get them to care. And the one thing that th gives them that impetus to care is the understanding that if they want to work with the leaders like yourselves in the future, if they want to succeed, they're gonna have to care about these issues collectively. We all have to care about climate change um, in order to survive. So it's our grand unifying force and it couldn't be more appropriate that we're looking at all these solutions that uh, that you're uh, uh, stewarding and shepherding Donaga and the technology that you're um, bringing to the world and then the network that you're building and, and the funding that you're um, doing, Rob. So thank you guys so much for your time, for uh, the opportunity to kind of learn and share uh, with everybody around the world on the things that are giving you hope and uh, I look forward to seeing the rest of these talks around the world. Uh, thank you to everybody at Future Food for setting this up and uh, can't wait to see this again next year.
Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Cheers. Happy birthday. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.